not do, did not sin. Uh, he was faithful in his service as a uh, as the builder of the house. Um, all of this in the story of Hebrews has really been presented as preparation. Uh, but now we get to verse 11 of chapter 9. And, and I believe what we have now is essentially the central point of what the author has been um, has been really setting this up for uh, all through this study. He wants us to see uh, the blood of the new cup. Um, now, we've already talked about the fact that uh, the prophecy that was made concerning Jesus was the fact that he would be a high priest uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. And we saw in last week's lesson and, and the week before that, the role of the high priest. What was his uh, responsibility? Well, he was uh, an intercessor. He was one who would bring the sacrifice of the people into the presence of God, specifically the Day of Atonement. Uh, that has clearly been a focus of the writer of Hebrews is on this Day of Atonement. There were other um, important significant days in the calendar of the Jews is, of course, Passover, Pentecost. Uh, but the writer of Hebrews doesn't talk about any of those things, but he does spend a lot of time talking about the Day of Atonement. If this was a unique role that only the high priest could fill. None of the other priests were qualified, could, uh, could you know, pinch it for him. This was his duty, his responsibility. Uh, and now He's essentially brought us to the point where Jesus is going to fulfill his role as high priest. Uh, we're going to look here, first of all, at verses 11 through 14. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to actually read these verses um, as we get started in this, because I really want this message to be clear in our minds um, as we do this. He says, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So here was his duty, his role as high priest. He was to enter into the tabernacle. So as I say, the stage has been set. You know, really more than half of the book now that we've looked at was simply setting the stage for Jesus to fulfill his role as high priest. And so he does that by coming in and bringing the blood of atonement. And the first uh, point the author makes is something he's already talked about in detail, the, the difference between the previous tabernacle, the one he says is still standing, and in doing so obscures the way into, uh, in, into salvation. Back in verse 8 here of chapter 9, he says that Christ appears as this high priest entering through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Then he explains why it's greater and more perfect. He says, because it was not made by human hands. Specifically, he says, it is not of this world. It is not of the creation. So when we talk about not made with human hands, uh, we don't need to think just of the tabernacle or Solomon's temple or Herod's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, all the other physical structures, but it, it's not of this creation at all. In other words, it's not physical. Uh, it, it wouldn't matter whether uh, the greatest builder who ever built had had uh, you know had made the greatest structure that he'd ever that he'd ever made. It still is made with things of this creation. Jesus entered to a tabernacle that is not of this creation. If it's not of this creation, then by definition, it must be eternal. It's something that existed before creation. It's not of creation. It must be eternal, just like he himself is eternal. This tabernacle is eternal. And, and we're going to see in just a little bit what we're talking, of course, about is the, 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 the home of God. He's going to appear in the presence of God. The Holy of Holies really was a representation uh, of God. His, 
name was there uh, in that room, and it represented his glory. It represented uh, his majesty as the creator. Uh, Jesus is entering into that tabernacle. And, and notice again the language here. He entered, um, uh, he, the first part of verse 11, he appears as a high priest of the good things to come. The, the writer of Hebrews has often shifted uh, intents. He talks about the things to come. He talks about the things to go. He talks about the things that are. Uh, and that is because we're in this time period where all of these things are happening. One is obsolete and is a, about to fade away. And another is coming, has come. We're going to see this shifting of tenses, both, in fact, we've been seen in this verse. Jesus appeared, that's past tense, and yet he appears as a uh, concerning these things that are to come. And we're going to talk about uh, a little bit at the end of this class, and a lot more so when we get into chapter 12, what this idea of to come means. Uh, but we're going to see this uh, shifting in, in tenses all through this section. So, He's entered into the greater and, and more perfect tabernacle. But not only has he entered into a greater tabernacle, he also is bringing a better sacrifice. In verse 12, he doesn't enter through this tabernacle through the blood of goats and calves. If Aaron had entered into the Holy of Holies without bringing blood, what would have happened to him? Well, the Bible is very clear. He would have died. If he had not brought a blood of atonement, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, he would have died coming into the presence of God because sin had not been atoned for. We see that Jesus is entering into this tabernacle, but he's bringing a blood that is not like that which Aaron brought. Not the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. Notice it doesn't say he carried his own blood. It says he entered through his own blood. His blood is what enabled him to be able to enter into this greater and more perfect tabernacle. There's a passage when we look at the story of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Luke has a, an interesting uh, language that is not found in Matthew, Mark, or John. Uh, in Luke 22 and verse 20. Says Jesus, likewise, the cup after they had eaten said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Two things I want you to notice about that. First of all, let's talk about the second part the new covenant of my blood. That's what the writer of Hebrews is making the point here that Jesus entered through his blood. His blood enabled the covenant to exist, to be inaugurated. It will. Speak more about that in the next few verses. But the second thing is, the term there that is poured out for you. Uh, Greek tenses um, are, are very specific. Uh, they not only will tell you whether it's past tense or present tense or future tense and even variations on that, but it will also tell you who it is that's doing the action. Now, English is not that clear. Uh, but Greek is very clear that the verb that is used here, poured out, tells you who it is that's doing the pouring. And Jesus used a verb tense there that says he was the one who was pouring out his blood. It's a very important point for us to recognize that when Jesus died on the cross, it was not because the Romans killed him, because the Jews had betrayed him and turned him over. It is ultimately because Jesus gave himself. He poured out his blood. And the reason why he poured out his blood is so that he could enter into the tabernacle. I want you to stop and think what it would have been like for a Jew at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses is gone. Well, first of all, they come to the mountain. And when they come there, the mountain is shaking, it's covered with a cloud. Uh, the voice of God, uh, you know, just thunders and it frightens the people to death. And then Moses receives from God the, the Ten Commandments. And he comes to the people and he tells them, These are, this is the covenant of God. We're going to look at that in just a moment. And 
then when the, the tabernacle was constructed, the tabernacle was inaugurated with blood. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. What would it have been like on that day of atonement for Aaron to have been cleansed and then this uh, beautiful ornate turban uh, placed on his head and the ephod on his shoulders and the breastplate that had the names of the tribes of Israel and the, the plate on the turban that says uh, 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 holy to God? What would have been the impression that that had on the people? to have watched Aaron to walk into the tent of meeting. Of course, they could not see what went on after that point. But to know that he goes on and goes into this tabernacle, he's carrying this blood, and he takes the blood into the tent, and after a period of time, he comes back out, that, and he has sprinkled this blood to uh, in the presence of God, a blood of atonement. What would have been the impression that that had on the people of Israel? Uh, Certainly, we would have recognized that it, it was a day of fasting. The other, uh, the other great days that they had were all feast days. But this was a day of fasting. This was a day of mourning because it had the, the reminder of their sins. That's why Aaron had to go there and do that. Now, the reason why I talked about all of that is to recognize what the writer of Hebrews is telling these Jewish Christians. He's telling them, that Jesus has appeared as our high priest. Jesus has taken this role that they had seen filled by Aaron and the other uh, 30 or 40 uh, high priests that Josephus tell us about. Jesus has taken this role, but he hasn't gone into a, a human tabernacle. He's gone into a greater tabernacle. And he hasn't been carrying the blood of animals, but instead he has entered with and through his own blood. The writer of Hebrews is trying to help these Jewish Christians understand how much greater this day of atonement is than any day of atonement that has ever been known among the people of Israel. That's what he wants them to see. That's why he keeps emphasizing this idea of greater. What Jesus has done is greater than anything that they had ever seen before. And so then in verse 13, it says, uh, or the last part of verse 12, excuse me, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The term redemption, um, imagine you have heard this before in sermons, was a term that was used to describe the price of freedom for a slave. Uh, if for some reason uh, the owner of a slave wanted to set him free, he had to purchase redeem him, pay a price for him to be redeemed. Or what would happen more often was if someone wanted to set free someone else's slaves, the owner would set a price and say, well, if you wanted to be free, this is the cost. This is how much it will cost uh, for him to be set free. This is, you know, this takes care of my loss. And so what we find is that Jesus, when he entered into the tabernacle, this greater and more perfect tabernacle, that what he received there, what he bought there, was our freedom. He returned or received our eternal freedom, freedom from sin. Uh, we had become slaves of sin, John 8 and verse 30, uh, 31 through 34. And he has purchased for us our freedom. We are set free because of him going through his blood into that tabernacle. Now, the author goes on here. Oh, let me, uh, Peter references this point and makes it so very clear for us. He said, if you call on the Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Those were the prices that would set. You know, a, a, uh, someone who was a slave owner may say, you, you have to give me uh, 10 talents of silver uh, if you're going to redeem my slave. Uh, Peter says we've been redeemed by things not perishable like silver or gold, but we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. 
perfect lamb that has been offered as a sacrifice for our sins. And Peter says, because of that, we need to conduct ourselves with fear. Not terror in the sense that we expect God to strike us dead at any moment. But it's a fear in recognizing the greatness of what has been done for us. That's the, that's the point that Peter's trying to get us to understand. We have been, someone has paid uh, an, an immeasurable price for our freedom. So what are we going to do with that? Are we going to turn our freedom into a license to sin? To become slaves all again? No. We, we don't want to become slaves. It's the idea that we need to treasure our freedom from sin so much that we're not willing to risk anything because of the price that was paid. That's what Peter's trying to get us to see. So as we return back now to Hebrews 9 and verse 13, notice again he's going to make this comparison. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. We don't, we're not going to take the time now, but Numbers chapter 19 speaks specifically of this idea of the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer. And it was designed to purify uh, someone who had become ceremonially uh, unclean. The ashes of the heifer were used to, uh, to purify them, to make them clean. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying uh, the sacrifice that was made on the Day of Atonement, the blood of the, the goats and the bulls, the sprinkling of the ashes of the heifer that would, uh, that would cleanse the one who had become unclean. And notice it said it sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. It, one who was unclean would become clean. But notice it was the flesh. It was the outward man. Uh, we talked about this back in chapter 8. The the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant might be simply uh, written in the idea that the Old Covenant was an outward-in covenant. In other words, it was cleansing the outward man uh, with the intent of trying to purify that which was inside. But the New Covenant is an inward-out covenant. Again, the emphasis there in Jeremiah 31, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, it's what God is doing to the heart. It's what God is doing to the soul. It's what God is doing to the mind. And that is what purifies the man, that which comes from within. That's where this covenant is written. That's where this covenant resides, is in the inside part of man. So here he says, the, the blood and the ashes would cleanse the outward man. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, this perfect Messiah, how much will it cleanse the inner man? Notice specifically, he says, cleanse the conscience of man. The Day of Atonement, and we're going to touch a little bit on what we're going to be covering next week, but the Day of Atonement was a day of remembrance of sin under the Mosaic Covenant. Our Day of Atonement is a day of forgiveness, forgiving, forgetting of sin. Our sins are taken away. Our consciences are cleared through this sacrifice. There is no longer any guilt. There is no longer any remembrance of our sins. That's what the promise of this new covenant is. And so it cleanses the conscience of man. But it's interesting, the language here at the end of verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry, the end of verse 14. Um, he offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Scholars have debated this uh, for years, and, and I've seen writers who've taken uh, each side of this view, this, this idea of what's the dead works that's being spoken of. Uh, is it Dead works that speak of the, the, the sinful actions that bring about death. The, Paul says the, the wages of sin is death. That's possible. But I don't really think that fits in the context of the writing of the book of Hebrews. The writing of the book of Hebrews has been a contrast between one covenant and another. Sin was something that was bad under both covenants. The writer of Hebrews has been talking about how this new covenant is 
is to take the place of the old covenant. To me, it makes more sense to recognize the dead works here is not simply speaking of being forgiven, you know, cleansed of our sins, but it's cleansed of what this covenant, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the deadness of that covenant. And I think that if we look in the book of Galatians in chapter 3, we see where Paul is going to uh, is going to make this connection for us. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3, beginning of verse 10, Paul says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for... The righteous shall live by faith, Habakkuk 2, 5, 4 and 5. But the law is not of faith, rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So here Paul is again dis making the same distinction we see in the book of Hebrews, the law and, and the promise, the, the law and faith. So he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Paul here is not directly addressing sin, but he's addressing the curse that comes from sin. And he talks about how that these works cannot be taken care of just by simply keeping the law. Because... Nobody does keep the law perfectly. But he talks about how Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not just simply from our sins, but from the curse of the law. And I believe that's the same sense in which it's used in the book of Hebrews. The writer here talking about cleansing your conscience from dead works uh, to serve the living God. Uh, let me pause now at this point and... Uh, see if anybody's got questions or comments about what we have talked about uh, up to this point. Um, I tend to agree with you about what the dead works are. And I think they're also just, they're dead because they could never give you eternal life. And they're dead in that sense. And it's, they, 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 are a, they were a stumbling block for not only for the Jews, but for any Gentile Christian who came under the influence of the Judaizers. It was a stumbling block that they felt like they had to keep these dead works, and it was keeping them from God. I mean, Paul really <laughs> belabors that point uh, a lot of times. So I, I think it makes perfect sense that the dead works of the law is something that had to be, they had to turn from if they were going to serve a living God. I appreciate that. Anybody else with any thoughts or comments on that? All right, well, let's, let's move on then to, um, uh, to verse 15. Uh, I thought it might be apropos considering uh, what's going on in our country to kind of consider uh, this section is being inauguration day, uh, because the author actually is going to use that term in verse 18 to talk about how Jesus inaugurated the new covenant. Uh, in verse 15, it says, and for this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, in order that since the death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to do all uh, to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats and the water and the scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 
we need to pause at this moment and talk about the term covenant as it's used in the New Testament, specifically here in the book of Hebrews. Uh, the Greek term uh, that is used and is translated covenant used, uh, I think, 33 times in the New Testament, 17 of those times, one more than half, um, is used just in the book of Hebrews. So it clearly is a, an extremely important concept. It, it would be easy for us uh, if every Greek word that's used in the Bible uh, could be translated by one English word that has a very clear and definitive meaning, and we would just have this one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, but that simply is not true. The Greek word covenant cannot be translated by just one English term, uh, because the, the Greek word that was translated covenant was more complex than that. It, it had at least two different concepts that were tied in together, and perhaps even three different concepts that were all tied in together. And the writer of Hebrews is in fact making a play on those differing concepts that are tied up within this one word. And unfortunately, when we translate that into English, we either have to use different words, uh, when, then you lose the kind of continuity there, or we have to use the same English word that doesn't give the complete understanding of the, of the meaning of the Greek word that was used there, which in fact is, is, um, uh, is a good translation of the Hebrew word that again had all those concepts uh, tied in together with it. And that's that's going to be especially true here. Um, in verse 15, it talks about being the mediator of a new covenant. And so here we find this idea of a covenant. It is compared to the first covenant. And it says that Jesus is going to be the mediator. But notice it says that a death has taken place. A death for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. So there we find here with this idea of covenant, the fact that there is a death associated with it. This helps us understand that covenant as it's being used in this particular section of the book of Hebrews is a, a somewhat of a special meaning or a more complex meaning than we normally think of. It is really used that if we were going to use one English word to try to translate this, we would actually use the word testament, as in the idea of the last meal and testament. It was a message that would take effect a legally binding agreement that would take effect at the death of the testator, uh, the one who has made this testament. Uh, now, not all covenants require death. Uh, in fact, uh, specifically the death of the one who made the covenant. Uh, certainly the covenants that God made with man, the covenant of promise that he made uh, to Abraham of giving him this land and, and making of him a great nation, there, you know, God does not die when he makes that promise. It doesn't need the death of God for that to come true. But that's the problem of understanding that the term covenant, in one sense, it talked about this agreement. But in another sense, it was a, uh, it was a testament that would take effect only at the death of the, of the testator. Uh, interestingly, that's the most common way that that term is used in secular Greek writing. Um, it was most commonly used to describe what we would call a last will and testament. Um, but it, it was also used in secular Greek writing in the way that the New Testament most commonly uses it in this idea of, a, uh, of an agreement that was made between two parties. So anyway, we find here when he talks about being a mediator of a new covenant, that the death has taken place to redeem for transgressions, to redeem for slavery. In verse 16, or let me first of all uh, point out Romans chapter 8. This is referencing the last part of verse 15 there, the eternal inheritance. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption of sons. We have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, so that we're no longer slaves. We're no longer to think of ourselves as slaves to sin. But instead, we have become sons of God. We are able to cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. 
provided we suffer with him, or that we may be glorified with him. Paul says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's, that's a great lesson. Anytime we go through those, those difficult times in life, those times where we suffer, oh, how we suffer is the, the, the line in the Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, instead of complaining, what we need to do is consider that the, that the inheritance that we receive uh, makes all the suffering completely worthless, not even, not even a comparison. And so the writer of Hebrews tells us here in Hebrews chapter 9 uh, that this needed this kind of death. In the Mosaic Covenant, there was a sacrifice of animals. They were symbolic, just like the entire covenant itself. And everything of the covenant was a symbol to point to something to come. The death of the animals was a symbol of something to come. But now that it has come, the death is very literal. The one who makes the covenant it is necessary for this one to die. Now, when we look at verse 16 and 17, this is a passage that's often very familiar to us because we're going to use this whenever somebody brings up the thief on the cross. When we talk about the fact that, that Jesus called for all of his disciples to be baptized to accept the covenant, uh, someone will say, all but the thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And since he was on the cross, he could not have been sacrificed. Or he could not have been baptized. And so we go to Hebrews 9, verses 16 and 17, to point out that when Jesus said that, he said that under the old covenant, the old covenant was still in effect because Jesus had not yet died. And that's true. That it, That's a valid argument to make. But don't take that passage out of its context, or in other words, don't miss what the writer is talking about in this context. It has much greater significance to us. What the writer is trying to tell us, it was necessary for our priest king to die. Keep that thought in mind as we look at Matthew chapter 16. We all remember the story of where Jesus had asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter had made the great confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus had spoken about what a blessing it was that Peter had understood that, had been revealed to him by God, and what that was going to mean. It was the foundation of what he came to build. But then just shortly after that, it says that Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he must be killed. And then on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. One of the strongest words that's used in the Bible to describe chastising or speaking against someone else. Peter began to rebuke Jesus. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. When we look at Hebrews 9, we understand a greater depth of what Jesus said here when he said, you're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God. It was the thing of God that for this covenant to come into effect, he must die. And that's the point the writer of Hebrews is, is that's really what verses 16 and 17 are telling us. He had to die. It was necessary for him to die for this covenant to go into effect. Now, as I mentioned, when we go back to um, Exodus chapter 24, when Moses had read this covenant, the Ten Commandments, to the people, they declared their intent to accept it. And when they did so, Moses took the blood and he sprinkled the book and the people. And we find here in Exodus 24, verses 6 through 8, he took half of the blood, put it in the basins, half the blood, he threw against the altar. Then he took the book, the book of the covenant, and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, we will be obedient. They say, we accept this covenant of God. And Moses took the blood, he threw it on the people, and he said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. And so here we find where this covenant is instituted later in, in Exodus chapter 40. This was not the same day. But when the tabernacle was 
um, constructed and erected and it was dedicated, we find where Moses had also sprinkled the tabernacle itself and all the vessels that were used within the tabernacle. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of that uh, down in verse uh, 21. In the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle, the vessels of the ministry with the blood, leading to the conclusion of verse 22. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. The only exception to the law was the things that were cleansed with fire or cleansed with water. And those were very rare exceptions that are found uh, in the book of Leviticus. But you essentially can say that all things were cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Now, the first part of that is actually something God had said to Noah back in Genesis chapter 9. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why he had forbidden them from eating blood in any, in any form. But now we find what that means for them in atonement. There had to be the shedding of blood. There had to be death to grant life. So this was the, this was the reason why he had to die because the covenant could not take effect. There could be no atonement. There could be no forgiveness without the sacrifice. All right, let me pause again at this point and see if anybody's got um, uh, any comments or any questions about what we have covered uh, down through verse 22. All right, let's pick up then the remainder of the chapter here, uh, beginning in verse 23. Uh, the writer again uses this word, therefore. Remember, this is, these are connecting terms, and it tells us what I'm about to say is connected and built upon what I've already said. So understanding the necessity of this uh, death to, for the covenant to be established, he tells us what this means. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. He's taking us back now to the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was this preparation, this cleansing uh, that, that was a reminder to them of their sin. So it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with this. The covenant itself, the people that accepted the covenant, the tabernacle that was the a dwelling place of God among them, and all the sacred vessels, all of these things had to be cleansed with blood. But he says, but the heavenly things themselves are, are what? Are cleansed with better sacrifices than these. Now understand here, this doesn't just mean that heaven is filthy. And when in John 14, when Jesus said, I go to the repair place where he's going and cleaning, tidying up the place to to get it ready for us. It's the idea of the removal of the guilt of sin. The, the, the sins of God cry, or the sins of man, I should say, cry out to God. And Jesus, by going into the reality of the temple, going into the presence of God, is dealing with that cry of sin, dealing with the stench that it brings to brings to God and instead bringing the fragrant aroma of his own sacrificial atoning blood. In verse 24, again, reminds us, Christ did not enter, yeah, step behind here, Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear at the presence of God for us. So remember, he's doing this through his blood, and he's doing this to appear in the presence of God, bringing this atoning sacrifice. So you have the, the real tabernacle, the real sacrifice of atonement from the real high priest. And this is done personally by Jesus, not personally in the flesh. This is done personally in the spirit. And he brings this into the presence of God. He brings this sacrifice, sacrifice of redemption for our sin. Sometimes people think, of, oh yes, well of course, that's what happened when Jesus ascended into heaven. 
this sacrifice was done when he died. You look at Matthew 27, and Mark makes the same point. When Jesus died, it tells us the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split. Jesus was bringing this atoning sacrifice, not literally into Herod's temple. But that was just symbolic to show that that temple no longer is. That there, it has nothing to do with the presence of God. In fact, it never did because the Spirit of God never entered that, type, uh, that temple. But this is to show that Jesus is bringing his redemption. Maybe what's made even clearer is Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation 5, John has been shown this vision of the book of God in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And the, the strong angel has cried out and asked the question, who is worthy to open the book? And we're told that John looked around and no one was worthy. And he began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The seven horns, the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. That image is to make it so very clear to us what made Jesus worthy to open the book was the fact that he had died. The fact that he had offered his worthy pure blood. That's what made him worthy to offer uh, this sacrifice and to be able to open this book. And so returning now back to uh, Hebrews chapter 9, notice it says in verses um, uh, verse 25, nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Again, we're going back to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement occurred every single year. Every year, the high priest had to go into this Holy of Holies, and he would bring blood, but it wasn't his own blood. He would bring the blood of the, boats, uh, of the bulls of the goat. But here we find that Jesus, our Messiah, has gone into the Holy Place one time. He does not offer his sacrifice over and over again. And I'm afraid that sometimes we try to impose our human limitations on that. I believe that many of what are called the high churches, the Roman Catholic Church, Episcopalian, the Lutheran, and so forth, they try to understand this by saying that the blood of Jesus um, essentially is offered every time in, in every mass. Uh, the Roman Catholics believe in the doctrine of transubstantiation, the idea that this Sacrifice is offered every time that they uh, have a mass for whatever reason. That once again, Jesus is offering his sacrifice. Um, as, as one writer uh, very appropriately said, however, uh, however good willing that might be, is blasphemy. And I agree, he is blasphemy. I'm afraid, though, that sometimes what we try to do is we try to figure out a different way of opposing our limitations of time. And we say, well, the blood of Jesus reaches backward uh, to sins that have previously been committed, reaches forward to sins that will be committed. But what we have to understand is God doesn't dwell in limitations of time. The blood of Jesus is. The sacrifice of Jesus is. Remember when he said to the Jews, before Abraham was born, I am. He didn't say I was. He didn't say I will be. He just said, I am. Now, grammatically, that doesn't make any sense at all. Before something that was in the past, I am present, doesn't, you know, grammatically, that doesn't make sense at all. But that's because we have this limitation of time. God is not limited by time. The sacrifice of Jesus simply is. It is the perfect atoning sacrifice for sin. So as we try to impose our, uh, our framework of time on that, we're really hurting ourselves in trying to do that. We just simply need to recognize the blood of Jesus 
is. It is our atoning sacrifice. Then we come to verses 27 and 28. Now, verse 27, I'll be honest, I used it in a bunch of sermons, and I think every preacher has used this with a bunch of sermons. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once after this comes to judgment, we tell people, you need to be ready for judgment because someday you're going to die and then it's going to be too late. Judgment comes after your death and it will be too late. And that is true. That is the pattern that is shown here. But really, the author is using this pattern to explain something that has far greater meaning. What he's doing is showing how the pattern of human life death followed by judgment illustrates the role as jesus as our high priest king he died and will appear a second time in judgment that's the point the writer of hebrews is getting at that. he's trying to show so christ also there's the connection what he said in verse 27 is to illustrate that this applies with jesus so christ also Having been offered once to bear the sins of many, having died, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Speaking of judgment. So what we find here is the death of Jesus means that there is going to be a judgment of Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews wants them to understand. Now, it's important we understand the context of who he wrote this to. He wrote this to uh, Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians who are very familiar with the, the law of Moses. It was written to them in a time in which this was still before them. As he said earlier in this chapter, the outer tabernacle was still standing. This was a time when the Jews were um, actively and vehemently persecuting them because the Jews thought that they were trying to destroy the law of Moses. This was a time period where this was a challenge for them that uh, of going back to the old law or uh, various aspects of the old law. We see that in Acts chapter 15, where some people came from Jerusalem and began teaching at Antioch. They had to be circumcised according to the custom of Moses to be saved. This was something that continued through this time period. Uh, from when the gospel was first taught on the day of Pentecost, really up until God's judgment against Israel. All of this was going on. And so within that context, we need to understand what the judgment that the author is talking about. I believe that he is talking about God's judgment on his chosen people. The covenant that he made with the children of Israel at Sinai had two sides to it. It had a side of salvation, and it also had a side of judgment. And those who did not accept that covenant, those who uh, would not keep that covenant, were to be destroyed. We saw that with generation after generation. But ultimately, God is going to bring that judgment on the people that he gave that covenant to. Now, what we find here is that Jesus has offered the, the, the atoning sacrifice. The blood of the bulls, the bulls and goats and calves, we're going to see in the next chapter, that could not forgive them of sin. But Jesus has now offered that sacrifice. But in doing so, he sets the timer. And the timer, when it runs out, Jesus is coming in judgment against his people. It's against those who rejected him, but the writer of Hebrews is looking at the other side. He's coming to save those who eagerly await him. You see, that's the message of the gospel for these Jews. It was to tell them that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Go all the way back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. What was it that uh, Philip said to Nathaniel? We have found the Messiah. We've been looking for him for centuries. We have now found him. That was the message for the Jew of the first century. Jesus has come as their Messiah. Look in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says here, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. 
for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us is a timer was set. There's a countdown. But we don't know the exact end of that countdown. Jesus said, we don't know the exact end of that countdown. But what does he tell us? In verse 44, therefore you must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has sent over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Those who are eagerly awaiting the coming of Jesus, the Jew that heard this message and understood that Jesus is the Messiah and is waiting for him to come again, when he comes, he will be blessed. When he comes, he will be placed over his possessions. Dempsey has been uh, talking about the Beatitudes. And what was the very first one of the Beatitudes? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, and again, the last of the Beatitudes again brings back and again says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They receive the possession of God. And so ultimately, I think that's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at here. He's telling them, Jesus died, the, the countdown has begun, and at the end of that countdown, Jesus is coming again. But the second time he comes, he's not going to come as an answer for sin. Instead, he's going to come and to give the possession to those that await him and to sit in judgment of those that have rejected. All right, yeah, let's stop at that point and see if anybody's got any questions um, or comments about what we've talked about. Hey, yeah, I quickly wish to ask something. Uh, I'm probably not exactly, I mean, it's slightly off topic, but I keep coming upon people who mention something that you mentioned in the previous verse from Matthew 5, uh, that uh, not a yota, not a dot will pass from the law until all, all is accomplished. Mm -hmm. I keep coming across people who claim that Jesus meant uh, that uh, the law is still in, in place, you know, and try to find contradictions and such things. And I know some interpretations of accomplish, like for example, that all the prophecies will be fulfilled and such things but what is your take on this uh, why what jesus means what does jesus mean by all is accomplished i i think that's a very good question and it fits really into what we're talking about uh, jesus came to fulfill all that god for intended to do we're going to see in the next chapter that he came to do his will uh, to fulfill what god had sent him for to be the high priest um, Again, only the high priest could fulfill this role of offering the blood of atonement. And so Jesus alone could fulfill that role that he was granted by the Father to be the high priest, the one who would offer his own blood as this blood of atonement. And so the law could not pass away. It, it could not be completed until that was fulfilled. The law was the shadow of the things to come. And so you can't take the shadow away until the reality is there. Uh, and so I believe that's what Jesus is talking about uh, there in Matthew chapter 5 and, and beginning of verse 18. That he, you know, the, the charge is going to be made against Jesus a number of times through his ministry that he was speaking against Moses and speaking against the temple, uh, that, that he was in fact trying to destroy those things. Um, and Jesus really kind of dealt with that argument even before it was made. He said, I did not come to destroy these. I came to bring them about to their completion to show what they have been in shadow. I'm going to show in reality. Uh, Mr. Did that uh, yep, thank you. help to explain? All right. Uh, those of you who don't know, Visser is a, is a dear friend of ours, uh, one of our uh, brothers in Bulgaria. And that's the wonderful thing about um, using our modern electronics. We're, we're studying together right now with a man who lives about 7,000 miles away from us. Um, and that's a, that, that's a great blessing. 
Yeah, hi everyone. Anybody else got any uh, questions or comments? Well, challenging stuff. I hope you will uh, consider to uh, continue to think deeply about the things that, that we've been talking about. Let me give you some questions to consider for next week. We'll be looking at the first 18 verses of chapter 10 uh, next week. And I've got just four questions for you to look at. What was the purpose of that day of atonement for the people of Israel? Uh, I'll give you a hint. I've, I've often heard it described um, as a day in which the sins of the people were rolled forward for, a, for another year, uh, almost like the picture of a big snow plow, uh, just pushing snow in front of it. Um, I do not believe that's what the purpose of the Day of Atonement was. Um, second question, what was the reason that Jesus came into the world? Uh, it'll say, it'll use that term to talk about him coming into the world. What was the, what was the reason, the purpose? Uh, the third question, what does the sacrifice of Jesus accomplish for us? The question number two is really looking at it from the viewpoint of Jesus. What was he trying to accomplish? And then question number three is, what does it mean for us? Uh, and then question four, and this is where we uh, it, it affects the way we think. There's a passage here that says there is no longer something. What is no longer necessary for us? Uh, and that's a challenging, kind of a scary thought um, when, when you look at that in, in Hebrews chapter 10, particularly verse 18. So anyway, look, think about those questions. Uh, read over if you would, verses 1 through 18. Uh, anybody with any uh, final comments? Yes, please, go ahead. Yes, Eddie, this is Tammy. Uh, wonderful lesson. I, I like it. I have a couple of questions on some of the books you um, uh, read off. Matthew yeah. and Exodus. What were those uh, chapters and verses in Matthew? Uh, Matthew was chapter 24. Um, and I think I started in verse 34. Let me go back and look real quick. All right, 34. Yes. Uh, 34. 34. Yeah, 34 down through 47, but I didn't read all of the verses. Okay, um, that's all right. And then you said Exodus as well? Yes, Exodus chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. 6 through 8. Okay. Yeah. That's when Moses all right. the book of the covenant and the people with blood. Okay, because I like to cross-reference and I like to look what you all say, but I can't keep up with you sometimes. <laughs> um I've got just I like, I like what we're learning. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, Tammy. Anybody else? Anybody else, anybody else with uh, questions or comments about what we covered today? All right. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Looks like Alex Meyer is here. Alex, would you mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, lead us in a prayer here at the conclusion of our class? Oh, uh, Alex doesn't have a microphone. Um, Dan Byers, how about you? Do you have a microphone and you can unmute yourself and, and lead a prayer for us? Okay, let's, let's bow. Our dear holy God and honorable Father in heaven, we come before you. We do thank you indeed for the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he died for us. He truly atoned for us so we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Now we ask you to go with us this week as we live our lives to help us to share the gospel with others and be with us until we assemble together as Christians. In Christ we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, Eddie. Yes. Uh, who was your friend that's 7,000 miles away? Uh, Mr. Pesha. Well, hello. Is he, a, is he a brother or is he studying? Yes. Yes, he's a brother in Christ. Uh, he was with that church in Bulgaria when we were there um, many years ago. <laughs> about about oh, 20 years ago. Uh, well, I'm always studying. 